the third book, entitled Thalia. The above-mentioned Amasis was the Egyptian king against whom Cambyses, son of Cyrus, made his expedition, and with him went an army composed of the many nations under his rule, among them being included both Ionic and Aeolic Greeks. The reason of the invasion was the following. Cambyses, by the advice of a certain Egyptian who was angry with Amasis for having torn him from his wife and children and given him over to the Persians, had sent a herald to Amasis to ask his daughter in marriage. His adviser was a physician, whom Amasis, when Cyrus had requested that he would send him the most skillful of all the Egyptian eye doctors, singled out as the best from the whole number. Therefore the Egyptian bore Amasis a grudge, and his reason for urging Cambyses to ask the hand of the king's daughter was that if he complied, it might cause him annoyance. If he refused, it might make Cambyses his enemy. When the message came, Amasis, who much dreaded the power of the Persians, was greatly perplexed whether to give his daughter or no, for that Cambyses didn't intend to make her his wife, but would only receive her as his concubine, he knew for certain. He therefore cast the matter in his mind, and finally resolved what he would do. There was a daughter of the late king Apries named Nititis, a tall and beautiful woman, the last survivor of that royal house. Amasis took this woman, and decking her out with gold and costly garments, sent her to Persia, as if she had been his own child. Some time afterwards, Cambyses, as he gave her an embrace, happened to call her by her father's name, whereupon she said to him, I see, O king, thou knowest not how thou hast been cheated by Amasis, who took me and tricking me out with gourds, sent me to thee as his own daughter, but I am in truth the child of Apries, who was his lord and master until he rebelled against him, together with the rest of the Egyptians, and put him to death. It was this speech, and the cause of quarrel it disclosed, which roused the anger of Cambyses, son of Cyrus, and brought his arms upon Egypt. Such is the Persian story. The Egyptians, however, claim Cambyses as belonging to them, declaring that he was the son of this Nititis. It was Cyrus, they say, and not Cambyses, who sent to Amasis for his daughter, but here they misstate the truth. Acquainted as they are beyond all other men with the laws and customs of the Persians, they cannot but be well aware, first, that it isn't the Persian won't to allow a bastard to reign where there is a legitimate heir, and next, that Cambyses was the son of Cassandani, the daughter of Phanaspes, an Achaemenian, and not of this Egyptian. But the fact is that they pervert history in order to claim relationship with the house of Cyrus, such is the truth of this matter. I have also heard another account, which I don't at all believe, that a Persian lady came to visit the wives of Cyrus, and seeing how tall and beautiful were the children of Cassandani, then standing by, broke out into loud praise of them and admired them exceedingly. But Cassandani, wife of Cyrus, answered, Though such the children I have borne him, yet Cyrus likes me and gives all his regard to the newcomer from Egypt. Thus did she express her vexation on account of Nititis, whereupon Cambyses, the eldest of her boys, exclaimed, Mother, when I am a man, I will turn Egypt upside down for you. He was but ten years old, as the tale runs, when he said this, and astonished all the women, yet he never forgot it afterwards, and on this account they say when he came to be a man and mounted the throne, he made his expedition against Egypt. There was another matter quite distinct which helped to bring about the expedition. One of the mercenaries of Amasis, a Halicarnassian, Phanes by name, a man of good judgment and a brave warrior, dissatisfied for some reason or other with his master, deserted the service and taking ship fled to Cambyses, wishing to get speech with him. As he was a person of no small account among the mercenaries, and one who could give very exact intelligence about Egypt, Amasis, anxious to recover him, ordered that he should be pursued. He gave the matter in charge to one of the most trusty of the eunuchs who went in quest of the Halicarnassian in a vessel of war. The eunuch caught him in Lycia, 
but didn't contrive to bring him back to Egypt, for Farnese outwitted him by making his guards drunk, and then escaping into Persia. Now it happened that Cambyses was meditating his attack on Egypt, and doubting how he might best pass the desert, when Farnese arrived, and not only told him all the secrets of Amasis, but advised him also how the desert might be crossed. He counseled him to send an ambassador to the king of the Arabs, and ask him for safe conduct through the region. Now the only entrance into Egypt is by this desert. The country from Phoenicia to the borders of the city Cadetis belongs to the people called the Palestine Syrians. From Cadetis, which it appears to me is a city almost as large as Sardis, the marts upon the coast till you reach Genesis are the Arabian kings. After Genesis, the Syrians again come in and extend to Lake Serbonis, near the place where Mount Cassius juts out into the sea. At Lake Serbonis, where the tale goes that Typhon hid himself, Egypt begins. Now the whole tract between Genesis on the one side and Lake Serbonis and Mount Cassius on the other and this is no small space, being as much as three days' journey, is a dry desert without a drop of water. I shall now mention a thing of which few of those who sail to Egypt are aware. Twice a year, wine is brought into Egypt from every part of Greece, as well as from Phoenicia, in earthen jars, and yet in the whole country you will nowhere see, as I may say, a single jar. What then, everyone will ask, becomes of the jars? This too I will clear up. The burgomaster of each town has to collect the wine jars within his district and to carry them to Memphis, where they're all filled with water by the Memphians, who then convey them to this desert tract of Syria. And so it comes to pass that all the jars which enter Egypt year by year and are there put up to sail, find their way into Syria, whither all the old jars have gone before them. This way of keeping the passage into Egypt fit for use by storing water there was begun by the Persians so soon as they became masters of that country. As, however, at the time of which we speak the tract had not yet been so supplied, Cambyses took the advice of his Halicarnassian guest and sent messengers to the Arabian to beg a safe conduct through the region. The Arabian granted his prayer, and each pledged faith to the other. The Arabs keep such pledges more religiously than almost any other people. They plight faith with the forms following. When two men would swear a friendship, they stand on each side of a third. He, with a sharp stone, makes a cut on the inside of the hand of each, near the middle finger, and taking a piece from their dress, dips it in the blood of each, and moistens therewith seven stones lying in the midst, calling the while on Dionysus and Urania. After this, the man who makes the pledge commends the stranger or the citizen, if citizen he be, to all his friends, and they deem themselves bound to stand to the engagement. They have but these two gods, to wit, Dionysus and Urania, and they say that in their mode of cutting the hair they follow Dionysus. Now their practice is to cut it in a ring away from the temples. Dionysus they call in their language Orotal, and Urania Alilat. When therefore the Arabian had pledged his faith to the messengers of Cambyses, he straightway contrived as follows. He filled a number of camels' skins with water, and loading therewith all the live camels that he possessed, drove them into the desert and awaited the coming of the army. This is the more likely of the two tales that are told. The other is an improbable story, but as it's related, I think that I ought not to pass it by. There is a great river in Arabia called the Chorus, which empties itself into the Erythrean Sea. The Arabian king, they say, made a pipe of the skins of oxen and other beasts, reaching from this river all the way to the desert, and so brought the water to certain cisterns which he had had dug in the desert to receive it. 
It's a twelve days' journey from the river to this desert tract, and the water, they say, was brought through three different pipes to three separate places. Samanitus, son of Amasis, lay encamped at the mouth of the Nile, called the Pelusiac, awaiting Cambyses. For Cambyses, when he went up against Egypt, found Amasis no longer in life. He had died after ruling Egypt forty and four years, during all which time no great misfortune had befallen him. When he died, his body was embalmed and buried in the tomb which he had himself caused to be made in the temple. After his son, Samanitus, had mounted the throne, a strange prodigy occurred in Egypt. Rain fell at Egyptian Thebes, a thing which never happened before, and which to the present time has never happened again, as the Thebans themselves testify. In Upper Egypt it doesn't usually rain at all, but on this occasion rain fell at Thebes in small drops. The Persians crossed the desert, and pitching their camp close to the Egyptians, made ready for battle. Hereupon the mercenaries in the pay of Samanitas, who were Greeks and Carians, full of anger against Phanes for having brought a foreign army upon Egypt, bethought themselves of a mode whereby they might be revenged on him. Phanes had left sons in Egypt. The mercenaries took these, and leading them to the camp, displayed them before the eyes of their father, after which they brought out a bowl, and placing it in the space between the two hosts, they led the sons of Phanes one by one to the vessel, and slew them over it. When the last was dead, water and wine were poured into the bowl, and all the soldiers tasted of the blood, and so they went to the battle. Stubborn was the fight which followed, and it wasn't till vast numbers had been slain upon both sides that the Egyptians turned and fled. On the field where this battle was fought, I saw a very wonderful thing which the natives pointed out to me. The bones of the slain lie scattered upon the field in two lots, those of the Persians in one place by themselves, as the bodies lay at the first, those of the Egyptians in another place apart from them. If then you strike the Persian skulls, even with a pebble, they are so weak that you break a hole in them. But the Egyptian skulls are so strong that you may smite them with a stone and you will scarcely break them in. They gave me the following reason for this difference, which seemed to me likely enough. The Egyptians, they said, from early childhood have the head shaved, and so by the action of the sun the skull becomes thick and hard. The same cause prevents baldness in Egypt, where you see fewer bald men than in any other land. Such then is the reason why the skulls of the Egyptians are so strong. The Persians, on the other hand, have feeble skulls because they keep themselves shaded from the first, wearing turbans upon their heads. What I've mentioned here I saw with my own eyes, and I observed also the like at Paprimis in the case of the Persians who were killed with Archimenes, the son of Darius, by Enerus the Libyan. The Egyptians who fought in the battle no sooner turned their backs upon the enemy than they fled away in complete disorder to Memphis, where they shut themselves up within the walls. Hereupon Cambyses sent a Mytilenean vessel with a Persian herald on board who was to sail up the Nile to Memphis and invite the Egyptians to a surrender. They, however, when they saw the vessel entering the town, poured forth in crowds from the castle, destroyed the ship, and tearing the crew limb from limb, so bore them into the fortress. After this Memphis was besieged and in due time surrendered. Here on the Libyans, who bordered upon Egypt, fearing the fate of that country, gave themselves up to Cambyses without a battle, and made an agreement to pay tribute to him, and forthwith sent him gifts. The Cyrenians, too, and the Bacchians, having the same fear as the Libyans, immediately did the like. Cambyses received the Libyan presents very graciously, but not so the gifts of the Cyrenians. They had sent no more than five hundred many of silver, which Cambyses, I imagine, thought too little. He therefore snatched the money from them, and with his own hands scattered it among his soldiers. 
Ten days after the fort had fallen, Cambyses resolved to try the spirit of Samanitas, the Egyptian king, whose whole reign had been but six months. He therefore had him set in one of the suburbs, and many other Egyptians with him, and there subjected him to insult. First of all, he sent his daughter out from the city, clothed in the garb of a slave, with a pitcher to draw water. Many virgins, the daughters of the chief nobles, accompanied her, wearing the same dress. When the damsels came opposite the place where their fathers sate, shedding tears and uttering cries of woe, the fathers, all but Samanitas, wept and wailed in return, grieving to see their children in so sad a plight. But he, when he'd looked and seen, bent his head towards the ground. In this way passed by the water-carriers. Next to them came Samanitas' son, and two thousand Egyptians of the same age with him, all of them having ropes round their necks and bridles in their mouths. And they too passed by on their way to suffer death for the murder of the Mytilineans, who were destroyed with their vessel in Memphis. For so had the royal judges given their sentence, for each Mytilenean ten of the noblest Egyptians must forfeit life. King Samanitas saw the train pass on and knew his son was being led to death, but while the other Egyptians who sat around him wept and were sorely troubled, he showed no further sign than when he saw his daughter. And now, when they two were gone, it chanced that one of his former boon companions, a man advanced in years, who had been stripped of all that he had and was a beggar, came where Samanitas, son of Amasis, and the rest of the Egyptians were, asking arms from the soldiers. At this sight the king burst into tears, and weeping out aloud, called his friend by his name, and smote himself on the head. Now there were some who had been set to watch Samanitas and see what he would do as each train went by. So these people went and told Cambyses of his behavior. Then he, astonished at what was done, sent a messenger to Samanitas and questioned him, saying, Samanitas, thy lord Cambyses asked of thee why, when thou sawest thy daughter brought to shame and thy son on his way to death, thou didst neither utter cry nor shed tear, while to a beggar who is, he hears, a stranger to thy race, thou gavest those marks of honor. To this question Samanitas made answer, O son of Cyrus, my own misfortunes were too great for tears, but the woe of my friend deserved them. When a man falls from splendor and plenty into beggary at the threshold of old age, one may well weep for him. When the messenger brought back this answer, Cambyses owned it was just. Croesus likewise, the Egyptians say, burst into tears for he too had come into Egypt with Cambyses, and the Persians who were present wept. Even Cambyses himself was touched with pity, and he forthwith gave an order that the son of Samanitas should be spared from the number of those appointed to die, and Samanitas himself brought from the suburb into his presence. The messengers were too late to save the life of Samanitas' son, who had been cut in pieces the first of all, but they took Samanitas himself and brought him before the king. Cambyses allowed him to live with him and gave him no more harsh treatment. Nay, could he have kept from intermeddling with affairs, he might have recovered Egypt and ruled it as governor. For the Persian wont is to treat the sons of kings with honor and even to give their fathers kingdoms to the children of such as revolt from them. There are many cases from which one may collect that this is the Persian rule, and especially those of Porcyris and Thanirus. Thanirus was the son of Enarus the Libyan, and was allowed to succeed his father, as was also Porcyris, son of Amirtaeus. Yet certainly no two persons ever did the Persians more damage than Amirtaeus and Enarus. In this case, Samanitas plotted evil and received his reward accordingly. He was discovered to be stirring up revolt in Egypt, wherefore Cambyses, when his guilt clearly appeared, compelled him to drink bull's blood, which presently caused his death. 
Such was the end of Samanitus. After this, Cambyses left Memphis and went to Sais, wishing to do that which he actually did on his arrival there. He entered the palace of Amasis and straightway commanded that the body of the king should be brought forth from the sepulchre. When the attendants did according to his commandment, he further bade them scourge the body and prick it with goads and pluck the hair from it and heap upon it all manner of insults. The body, however, having been embalmed, resisted and refused to come apart, do what they would to it. So the attendants grew weary of their work, whereupon Cambyses bade them take the corpse and burn it. This was truly an impious command to give, for the Persians hold fire to be a god, and never by any chance burn their dead. Indeed, this practice is unlawful both with them and with the Egyptians, with them for the reason above mentioned, since they deem it wrong to give the corpse of a man to a god, and with the Egyptians because they believe fire to be a live animal which eats whatever it can seize, and then, glutted with the food, dies with the matter which it feeds upon. Now to give a man's body to be devoured by beasts is in no wise agreeable to their customs, and indeed this is the very reason why they embalm their dead, namely to prevent them from being eaten in the grave by worms. Thus Cambyses commanded what both nations accounted unlawful. According to the Egyptians it wasn't Amasis who was thus treated, but another of their nation who was of about the same height. The Persians, believing this man's body to be the king's, abused it in the fashion described above. Amasis, they say, was warned by an oracle of what would happen to him after his death. In order, therefore, to prevent the impending fate, he buried the body, which afterwards received the blows, inside his own tomb near the entrance, commanding his son to bury him when he died in the furthest recess of the same sepulchre. For my own part, I don't believe that these orders were ever given by Amasis. The Egyptians, as it seems to me, falsely asserted to save their own dignity. After this, Cambyses took counsel with himself and planned three expeditions. One was against the Carthaginians, another against the Ammonians, and a third against the long-lived Ethiopians, who dwelt in that part of Libya which borders upon the southern sea. He judged it best to dispatch his fleet against Carthage and to send some portion of his land army to act against the Ammonians, while his spies went into Ethiopia under the pretense of carrying presents to the king, but in reality to take note of all they saw, and especially to observe whether there was really what is called the Table of the Sun in Ethiopia. Now, the Table of the Sun, according to the accounts given of it, may be thus described. It's a meadow in the skirts of their city, full of the boiled flesh of all manner of beasts, which the magistrates are careful to store with meat every night, and where whoever likes may come and eat during the day. The people of the land say that the earth itself brings forth the food. Such is the description which is given of this table. When Cambyses had made up his mind that the spies should go, he forthwith sent to Elephantini for certain of the Ichthyophagi who were acquainted with the Ethiopian tongue, and while they were being fetched, issued orders to his fleet to sail against Carthage. But the Phoenicians said they wouldn't go since they were bound to the Carthaginians by solemn oaths, and since besides it would be wicked in them to make war on their own children. Now when the Phoenicians refused, the rest of the fleet was unequal to the undertaking, and so it was that the Carthaginians escaped and were not enslaved by the Persians. Cambyses thought not right to force the war upon the Phoenicians, because they had yielded themselves to the Persians, and because upon the Phoenicians all his sea surface depended. The Cyprians had also joined the Persians of their own accord and took part with them in the expedition against Egypt. As soon as the Ichthyophagi arrived from Elephantini, Cambyses, having told them what they were to say, forthwith dispatched them into Ethiopia with these following gifts, to wit a purple robe, a gold chain for the neck, armlets, an alabaster box of myrrh, and a cask of palm wine. The Ethiopians, to whom this embassy was sent, are said to be the tallest and handsomest men in the whole world, 
In their customs they differ greatly from the rest of mankind and particularly in the way they choose their kings for they find out the man who is the tallest of all the citizens and of strength equal to his height and appoint him to rule over them. The Ichthyophagi on reaching these people delivered the gifts to the king of the country and spoke as follows. Cambyses, king of the Persians, anxious to become thy ally and sworn friend, has sent us to hold converse with thee, and to bear thee the gifts thou seest, which are the things wherein he himself delights the most. Hereon the Ethiopian, who knew they came as spies, made us.